Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive and in today's video we will be looking at this Tesla Model 3. Tesla has a bit of a reputation for building excellent software and the tech side of things but not quite finishing the car hardware. So that's what I want to clarify a bit in today's video because that statement may have been true in 2013 but times have moved on so let's take a look at this facelifted Model 3 showing what Tesla is doing right now. To start with aerodynamics. You have to keep in mind that the Model 3 sits at the bottom of Tesla's lineup and is designed to be as simple as possible but it still has a lot of tricks up its sleeve. In terms of active aero there is not much besides the fact that the front air intake can be shut off if cooling is not required. But if you look at the sides of the front bumper you can see the side air intakes. Unlike many other manufacturers, these are not actually fake and continue through to the side. The idea is that the air which flows through forms a curtain over the front wheel which reduces air turbulence. Speaking of wheels, this is the performance spec, so it has the biggest 20 inch wheels. Not exactly the most efficient, but the standard the car comes on 18 inch wheels and these are specifically designed for achieving maximum efficiency. That is somewhat of a difficult task with wheels because to keep a wheel aerodynamic the face should be as flat as possible but it creates a different problem which is using too much material. Too much material means increased weight. The weight matters with wheels more than anywhere else in the car because we are talking about a rotating mass. As a general rule of thumb if you want to relate the moment of inertia of the wheel to the inertia of the entire vehicle you are looking at about a 1 to 4 ratio. That means that about a kilogram saved on the wheel is like removing 4 kilograms from the car itself. So if you manage to save a kilo on every wheel that's like saving 16 kilos elsewhere in the car. The way Tesla tackled that challenge is that they created an alloy wheel which is very simple in design and has the minimum amount of material just to keep it structurally sound and lightweight and a plastic cover going over the top of it to help with the aerodynamics. Moving up here and taking a look at the windscreen wipers, first thing you notice is that there are no washer nozzles on the bonnet itself. These are actually integrated into the viper arms which not only makes the bonnet look very neat but also means when you turn them on they don't make a mess all over the windscreen. Secondly, this may be a bit tricky to spot at first but the vipers have two positions at the bottom of the stroke. When they are inactive they tuck in as close underneath the bonnet as possible to reduce wind whistle and improve efficiency but once they are on to reduce the risk of impacting each other when they are at the bottom part of the stroke they stay a bit higher up and only tuck back in when the system recognizes that there is no more rain on the windscreen. Moving down the side we absolutely need to discuss the door handles. To keep the design simple they do not electronically pop out like on the Model S nor do the doors automatically open like on the Model X. Out of those three this is honestly my favorite solution because there is less to go wrong yet it keeps the flush aerodynamic design. If you are not familiar to operate them you put your thumb onto the white part and use the other fingers to open the door. The way the mechanism works is that there is a little micro switch on the inside which releases the door latch just like we have seen on boot releases for decades. You may wonder how they fare in the winter with snow and ice but the answer is actually pretty well. The parts on the inside of the door are actually designed to leak a little bit of the interior heat through the door handles. That means that if you are preconditioning your car or you are driving along in cold weather any kind of ice built up should be melted without any problems. Moving further back it may seem like there is nothing else to show but if you look carefully you will realize there isn't even a shark fin aerial on the roof. That's because the FM antenna is integrated into the rear glass and the 4G and Wi-Fi modems are inside of one of the wing mirrors. Lastly if we put the car up in the air just like any other EV it has a flat floor because of the battery pack but Tesla went one step further and designed specific aerodynamic plastic covers for the rear control arms on the suspension so when the car sits on the ground the suspension does not protrude which would disrupt the airflow underneath the car. The second thing which deserves a bit of attention is the glass roof. 
Yes, we have seen many panoramic glass roofs on cars before, so what's different here? Well, the reason why it comes on all cars as standard and is not an option is because it actually fills a functional purpose. When you look closely, you will see that there is a structural beam going across the car, right behind the front passenger and driver's heads, from which you get a continuous piece of glass all the way to the back. With the glass being so much thinner than a traditional metal roof covered by a headliner on the inside, this means that the seats can be moved a little bit up without compromising on headroom. This is crucial because this means even if you are fairly tall and you sit in the back, it doesn't feel like you are sitting with your knees around your ears because of the battery pack in the floor. This is also the reason why the Model 3, because of its more compact dimensions, cannot afford to be a liftback, because if the hinge for the rear boot were to move, it would need to be located roughly halfway down the current rear glass, which is exactly above the rear passenger's heads. To make the whole design work, especially in sunny countries like California, there is a special UV and infrared reflective layer embedded into the glass, which means that even on a lovely summer day, you will not get sunburned in the car. In fact, in some lighting conditions, if you have water droplets or condensation on the roof, it may turn orange, and that's exactly due to the layer doing its job. Why not use a simple sunshade then, instead of all of this high-tech stuff? Again, it would eat into the headroom, defeating the purpose of the design in the first place, and as I mentioned in my first point on aerodynamics and efficiency, and in the context of electric cars, or any cars for that matter, weight is bad. I promised I would focus on the automotive side of things, but it's very difficult to talk about a Tesla without mentioning any of the infotainment, so please bear with me. As you probably know by now, the Model 3 only has a single central display and no instrument cluster nor a head-up display to project information into the windscreen. It may seem to be a weird compromise to do in order to cut cost, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Firstly, yes, having a single big screen is significantly cheaper for the manufacturer than using two separate smaller screens. Even if we ignore the cost of parts, Having one fewer wiring harness and screen to put in means a lot of labor costs saved during the assembly process. Why should you care about that as a customer though? Well, pretty much every mass-produced car is built to a budget, like it or not. So the money saved here can be spent elsewhere in the vehicle. I'm talking about stuff like having multi-link suspension not only in the back but in the front as well, heated seats all around electrically adjustable seats with memory as standard, electrically adjustable steering column, having all the hardware with the cameras for the autopilot included, and so on. The other thing is, controlling everything through a touchscreen only is not really a trade-off. You have to compare it with the history of mobile phones. When the iPhone came out, everybody thought that Apple was crazy and having a touchscreen only phone would be a very niche product. Well, look at the smartphone market now. Even if you're an Android user, one thing is for certain, and that is that the form factor was far superior to anything else on the market. And that's because the touchscreen allowed infinite flexibility. That applies to these cars as well. That means that over time, features can be added, buttons can be moved about based on user experience research, bad design and implementation decisions, which happen with all companies, can be fixed later on, it just makes sense. I would also like to address the fact that many people claim that touchscreens are distracting. Yes, if you try to use one while driving, that may be the case, but the bigger the screen, the less you need to use it while driving. Let me show you my point. So if I set a destination into the satnav to Edinburgh, for example, I get a fantastic view of the map, so I don't need to zoom in or fumble with anything while I'm driving. It's easy to glance down and see where I'm supposed to go. I still have the music controls accessible, and I also have the autopilot view, so if the car is in control of the driving, I can judge whether to trust it or not. That means I've got three pieces of information visible all at the same time without having to go through submenus and so on. If you're still not convinced because you insist that, for example, the climate control settings should be accessible without having to look down, well, that's the case here as well. 
The voice control is very robust. Let me show you. Set the temperature to 21 degrees. That's it, the temperatures are set. I did not need to look down or interact with the screen once. And yes, to access the glove box, you also need to go into the screen, into the menu, and tap the open glove box button. The reasoning being that with it being an electromechanical switch instead of a traditional mechanical button, you can have the glove box pin protected separate from the car and you can remotely lock it and unlock it. So if you are lending the car to someone, you don't have to worry about what's stored inside. While I'm on the topic of the simplistic interior design, I think we need to take a look at how the single air vent operates in the Model 3. I understand that some people may find the whole design a bit too boring and bland, but look at it this way, if I walk into your living room, I am pretty sure that the air vents for your air conditioning are not going to be the design centerpiece. This takes a very similar approach, and there's actually a lot of clever engineering behind it. This slimline design allows the entire dashboard to be compressed down, giving you a great view out onto the road. On top of that, yes, all of the airflow directional controls are electronic. Not just for the sake of being electronic, but it brings some very clever comfort features. For example, if you want to defrost the car in the winter, the system itself can automatically point most of the warm air towards the windows. However, the moment I sit inside, I can set it to diffused, so the airflow is split nicely across the entire dashboard, so it doesn't feel like I'm blasted in the face with hot or cold air. The other reason for the electronic controls is because it's actually impossible to control this kind of an air vent design manually. This is not like the Porsche Taycan, where the air vents operate just like standard air vents, and the slats inside are moved electronically. The Model 3 has two perpendicular air vents on the dashboard. The main one you see normally does have slats inside which enable the airflow to be directed side to side. But to adjust how high or low the air is blowing, the fan speed of the perpendicular air vent is adjusted to deflect the air accordingly. I don't think I've seen that on any other car. Powering the HVAC system under the hood is a heat pump. It's not just any heat pump like on most EVs, but it's very tightly integrated with the battery pack and the rest of the drivetrain to scavenge heat and move heat around as efficiently as possible. And it makes a huge difference, especially on long journeys. But I think that needs a dedicated video, so subscribe if you don't want to miss that. The last topic to address is the key, or better said, the lack of it. Pretty much all of us have one of these, so why the need for a separate key fob when we already carry a digital device on us at all times anyways, and today's cars are suitably equipped to communicate with them accordingly. And that's what all of these newer Teslas do. You can simply use the Tesla mobile app as a key to get into the car. And that doesn't mean going into your phone, searching for the app and pressing a button. The car uses Bluetooth signal triangulation to determine how far you are away from the car, where exactly you are located and whether you are approaching the car or walking away. This means that I can touch any of the door handles and when I do that, the car simply unlocks on its own. To start the car, given it's electric, there is no need for a dedicated start-stop button. I simply sit in the driver's seat, tap the brake pedal and the car is on. It should be as simple as that. The same when I'm done with it, I simply step outside, walk away, and the car locks itself. If your phone is out of battery or you forgot it somewhere, you get a key card as a backup. It's just like a hotel key card, meaning you walk up to the car and to unlock it, you tap the card right underneath the autopilot camera on the B pillar, and the car simply unlocks. It's the same process to lock it. I can't even count the benefits of this as a backup over a standard key fob. Firstly, it fits into my wallet, which I have to carry anyways for my other cards. If it gets stolen, it's very easy to remove old cards right from the infotainment system. It's much cheaper to replace, only a couple of pounds compared to a couple of hundred for a key fob. It doesn't run out of battery, you don't have to worry about it getting soaking wet in the rain, and so on. Before I close off, I want to show you how responsive the Tesla app is though. So I open it now, and the car is already connected. 
when I issue any of the commands, I don't have to wait for 30 seconds for the command to be uploaded to the Tesla server and then downloaded by the car, and then I get a confirmation back on my phone. It's nearly instant. Let me show you. So for example, if I want to unlock the car, I am pressing the unlock button now. That's it. Lock. Starting preconditioning. The AC is running. Turning off now. AC off. This is about as good as it gets and really should be the standard for all automotive manufacturers to follow. I think that's it for today. Let me know what your thoughts are on the facelifted Model 3. There is a lot more to go into. This car still has not undergone preparation, so if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and we can make a couple more videos on the car addressing the topics you want to hear about. With that said, thank you very much for watching and see you in the next one.